Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the November 2022 um, Cook County uh, Commission on Social Innovation meeting. Um, we will um, call the meeting to order, and then we'll um, ask Dalia if she can please call to see if we can establish quorum. I think we're a few members short, but we'll start noting um, the members, and uh, we'll proceed with the agenda as a few other members join us. Uh, Talia. Okay, hello everyone. Okay, to start with attendance, uh, Chair Anaya. Present. Vice Chair Lane. Present, thank you. Commissioner Aguipe. Mayor Osbury. Commissioner Alston. Commissioner Anderson. Commissioner Brutus. Commissioner Caliento. Present. Commissioner Cooley. Present. Ex officio criticos. Um, Commissioner De Laurentiis. Commissioner Dubot. Here. Um, Commissioner Espinosa. Commissioner Flores. Let me let Harry in. Okay. Um, Commissioner Freeman. Commission Alderperson Haddon. Superintendent Killen. Present. Commissioner Mails. Good day, everyone. Present. Commissioner Malone. Commissioner Raymer. Present. Commissioner Rice. Commissioner Schleiser. Commissioner Thomas. Present. All right, thank you. Um, I'm not sure if we um, noted um, Harry, but he did join us. So I'll make sure that um, the minutes uh, reflect that he is present. Um, okay, so we will. Um, we are going to um, defer the approval of the minutes because um, I believe an outdated version was sent out to folks. So there is there there are some updates that um, will need to be corrected in the minutes. So we are going to table and and defer uh, the minutes until the next meeting. Um, therefore, you know, we can uh, approve the correct and most updated uh, minutes. But um, before we move on to um, just general updates, I'll ask um, if there were any public testimony from um, uh, anybody that, that needed uh, to submit public testimony. Atalia, did we have any edits to the agenda or any public testimony for today? No, we didn't have any for today. Thank you. Um, so I guess we'll uh, go into general updates. I'll do a very quick update and um, we'll definitely um, have, uh, you know, at the next meeting, a little bit more information. But um, on my end, for the Cook County Board of Commissioners, we um, are in the budget process. So um, we have begun, last week we did our departmental budget hearings, and I just wanted to make sure that this a commission was updated on where our budget is at at the county and some of the initiatives that we're looking into. Um, I know a, a few of them might be of interest to the commission, and I'd be, again, more than happy to uh, discuss this a little further at the up upcoming meeting um, uh, in December. I know we're, we're planning to do one potentially in person. It would be a working meeting. Um, but just to give you all an update, um, the budget that has been proposed has been an $8.75 billion budget. Um, and this uh, includes some of the capital and grant funds that will be available. It is the smallest uh, gap um, under President Preckwinkle, um, uh, and I think it's a the the gap is about eighteen point two million dollars. Uh, uh, so um, the general operating budget that um, is excluding capital. Um, benefits and debt payments is uh, $7.23 billion um, for a little over $4 billion, which are in the public health sector, uh, 
uh, for the public safety. And then after that, you know, there's economic development and some other um, initiatives. So I think the biggest portion of the budget, I think it's a total of 78,000 is uh, of our operating budget is going to be going into the public health and public safety accounts. Um, so just some uh, general um, uh, captions of uh, some of the initiatives that we're looking into. So part of the president's um, priorities um, and, and policy uh, have really gone into six buckets. Number one is healthy communities. So there um, we're looking at um, uh, the annual um, county care membership of uh, 391,000, which is something that we're expecting might you know, decrease. Um, this is important because it is the biggest uh, revenue um, a bucket that we do receive in the county and it you know helps pay for some of our initiatives. Um, within the vital communities, we're seeing um, a $50 million allotment for equity fund investments under safe and thriving communities, a $24 million in grants uh, to support the equity fund, but also um, just some of the other initiatives that we're, we are, we're going to be um, seeing uh, along the way in, in public safety. And that really um, also has to do with some of the violence prevention initiatives. Under sustainable communities, uh, we're seeing that, um, you know, we, we're, we're trying to make investments into um, becoming a zero admission county. So we've set goals internally, and I know that there's going to be some initial um, conversations um, as part of the new, new year and the new terms. Um, and then under smart communities, um, there is an investment of $8.5 million in infrastructure and just generally in the different commissioner districts. Um, and then I know, uh, you know, we're very proud um, as uh, this budget comes forward that we have seen some increase in some of the um, ratings that we've been receiving. So Moody has us as at a eight, eight, uh, two. We have um, S&P has us at an A plus, and then Fitch has us as, a, as an AA minus. So um, we're really excited about just the general uh, initiatives that we're looking at. I know some of you all have been a part, and I, we made announcements at the last meeting regarding um, uh, guaranteed income, the uh, Justice Advisory Council initiatives of, around violence prevention. So we're really excited that a lot of these are moving forward and that we're setting a really good uh, foot forward um, so that even beyond ARPA funding, that we can do initiatives that are impactful and innovative in Cook County. So that's just a really quick uh, brief update in general regarding the county. Um, and, uh, you know, we are going to be uh, amendments to the budget. Um, our uh, the last day is tomorrow, but we're going to be voting on a final budget on November 17th. Um, the other thing um, that I wanted to make sure to make an announcement on is um, this is the the my last um, social innovation committee uh, as of uh, my first um, in my first term um, because come December fifth uh, a whole um, you know uh, commissioners get um, uh, uh, inaugurated so we're excited um, uh, to see you know what the second term uh, brings um, so we are. I'm um, going to continue having the social innovation committees. Um, it looks like I will uh, potentially continue to, to be able to serve on, on this commission. So I'm excited um, about that. And we will um, make sure to keep you all updated on any other updates. And I will turn it over to our vice chair, Elaine, if um, he has any updates on his end. I do. And uh, Commissioner and I, I wanted to congratulate you on uh the significant progress the board has made in terms of credit rating. Uh, it's a reflection of uh, wonderful stewardship and uh, responsibility. And uh, thank you for your leadership in this area uh, and others. So thanks for that. I have uh, two uh, announcements. Uh, one, by way of reminder, uh, for the December meeting of the commission, we're going to be departing from our typical pattern in that we will not have an expert witness providing testimony, but rather we will have each of the working groups make a comprehensive presentation on uh, their efforts to develop actionable social policy recommendations uh, that might uh, become uh, ordinances or policies with teeth in them. Uh, so my expectation is that we will be collectively workshopping those ideas, taking 
the work of the working groups and now exposing that work to the commission at large so we can move forward with the actual outcomes. So uh, that, that leads to two different uh, recommendations. One, uh, the chairs of the respective working groups are encouraged to meet with your groups in a substantive fashion between now and the next meeting and uh, see that we can have the best possible product as a starting point for the deliberations of the commission as a whole. And uh, two, uh, it's important that everybody participate in the December meeting because uh, it will uh, lead to the results that we've all been working so hard to accomplish. It will also find its way into the annual report that the commission is obliged to publish each year. And I wanna make sure that that report evidences the, uh, the hard work and the accomplishments and the efforts and the results of the commission over the course of the past year. So thank you for that. Uh, the second uh, announcement is uh, kind of a point of personal privilege. I happen to uh, be the chair and president of a nonprofit called Social Enterprise Chicago, uh, which uh, convenes, collaborates, and catalyzes uh, uh, social uh, enterprises in the Chicago region, uh, market-based strategies to drive social change. And we are going to be having our <laughs> off event uh, one week hence at five o'clock next Thursday at the Union League Club. Uh, I will be having a fireside chat with former Governor Quinn, uh, who was uh, responsible, among other things, for having signed the L3C legislation I drafted, the Benefit Corporation legislation, the state's first pay for success initiative, of uh, the Governor's Task Force on Social Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Uh, I talk about Illinois as the Delaware of social enterprise, and much of it started during his administration. So I would encourage all of you, uh, not only present as a commissioner, but any members of the public who are listening to us today, or watching us today, uh, please, uh, we'd love to have you join us. There will be opportunities uh, to uh, talk with the governor and uh, have a beverage and food uh, and network uh, with others who are like-minded. And uh, you can either participate in person, as I hope you will, or virtually. And if you want to get the specifics, uh, you'll find it on my Facebook page. Uh, or alternatively, send me an email and I'll be happy to, to send you a link to the event. And I would hope to see many of the commissioners and many members of the public who are uh, participating in this uh, meeting to uh, to be present and uh, share their excitement and enthusiasm for the social enterprise community that we are seeking to celebrate next week. So thanks for that and thanks for allowing me the opportunity to to, uh, to talk about that a little bit. And uh, Madam Chair, if it's uh, comfortable for you, I think that uh, everybody is eager to hear our our guest and his uh, actionable policy recommendations. So might I move right into that? Please. Well, thank you. Oh, and, actually, uh, um, Vice Chair, um, I do see Christy De Laurentiis had her hand up. Was this in regards to any of the announcements, Christy? Oh, you're muted. Sorry. Thanks. Thanks for opportunity to pose a question to you, uh, Vice Chair Lane. Yes. I wanted to just get a sense from you. Are you when you're interested in, or when you're when when the annual reports get filed? How are we supposed to submit information that we think has been advanced through the efforts of this committee? Just provide you a summary, a bullet list? What's what's the vehicle? Yeah, well, Chair and I and I will probably be doing the, uh, the heavy lifting on that report. So to the extent you can provide either of us any substantive information you'd like to see included in the report, one, that'll help us out, and two, we'll make sure that it gets in the report. So thank you for that. Okay, yeah, I wanted to make sure that uh, I think this this body has been instrumental in the food desert passage in uh, my own, you know, my organization, South Suburban, you know, Southland Reactivation Act legislation and some other initiatives. So uh, I'll be happy to provide that to you, just a couple of summaries and you can do with it what you will. Thank you. Very much appreciate that. Thank you for that. Okay, now on to uh, Professor Gerloff. Uh, it's it's really a, a, a treat to have uh, Stephen Durloff with us this afternoon. Um, he is uh, the state's professor at the um, 
Harris School of Public Policy in Chicago. Uh, Staines is uh, kind of an iconic name in social impact circles. Um, uh, not only Harrison Staines, the Staines Family Foundation, but as you may know, Heather Staines, who uh, recently uh, retired from the Senate, um, was in fact the primary sponsor of the L3C legislation. She also rose to become the chair of the Appropriations Committee in the Senate. So uh, his, uh, his professorship uh, recognizing the family's contribution uh, says a lot about him and uh, his efforts and contributions to the field. But he also now uh, fairly recently became the director of the Stone Center for Research on Wealth Inequality and Mobility, uh, which really is a reflection of his um, research and writings uh, on uh, inequality, intergenerational mobility, uh, discrimination, economic growth, uh, areas that are all of great concern to each of us and within the sweet spot of our work as it happens. Uh, and today he's going to be offering uh, actionable policy recommendations uh, looking at um, the uh, socioeconomic isolation of African-American communities in particularly, and how policies uh, might look at persistent disadvantage and how that might be overcome through such efforts as intensive education all the way up through and including uh, zoning practices and policies. So, uh, Stephen, thanks so much for joining us. The floor is yours, and we're delighted to have you. Well, yeah, thank you. It's an honor to 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 speak to you. I'm a little worried that uh, you, uh, what I have to say may not be actionable, uh, in the, but what I hope will be useful is I can give you some perspective from the contemporary research and inequality and how would one would think about various uh, policies to ad address social injustices. Uh, let me also start by saying a lot of uh, my thinking on this has been influenced by trying to be thinking about issues of reparations. And I want to mention a former PhD student at Chicago, David McMillan, who's now at Emory University, who's had a, a deep impact on my thinking. So if I say this is my idea, in many ways, it's our ideas and something we're actively writing writing on. So let me, with those caveats, uh, uh, indicate what I think might be useful ways to think about some of the policies, and then I'll try to give some specifics. Uh, I think that if one sort of asks about the evolution of research on inequality, or let's say academic thinking on inequality, um, you know, Chicago has always been at the forefront of it, but it was traditionally kind of a, uh, you know, a, a markets driven and uh, individual education, family specific uh, vision of what determines inequality dynamics. I think that modern research um, uh, identifies uh, a few phenomena to think about and, and a slightly different language to think about in the sorts of policies that that you're making decisions about with reference to, uh, uh, to, to the allocation of resources. So what do I mean by that? I guess the first thing to say is that in thinking about uh, the ethics of inequality, uh, I think there's there's really two ideas that have become uh, fundamental in the way that uh, that normative considerations are done, and, and they're going to both sound obvious, but they have deep implications. The first one is to argue that the governments should try to rectify inequalities that people aren't responsible for. And so the obvious examples of that would be the accident of birth. If somebody has rich parents versus poor parents, that induces an what he is responsible for. Obviously, any sorts of discrimination are the morally easiest examples of egregious violations of that principle. The second idea would be that people should, in some sense, it's going to again sound banal, people should get what they deserve. But what does that mean operationally? It means that if two people work equally hard in school, their opportunities for college should uh, should reflect that, and not again, you know, factors that uh, are not rewarding them for uh, for the things we think that uh, generate the notion of dessert. I mention that because I think that that's at least one of the templates to run policies through. In other words, say that we have objectionable forms of inequality and do the policies directly uh, directly affect these objectionable forms. Now, it's not really my place to talk to you you all about uh, political feasibility, but I think in terms of creating political you know, will to do these things, emphasizing these ethical considerations has to be paramount. The second thing that I would say is that in thinking about inequality, um, it's very important to actually think about dynamics. Now, again, that sounds obvious, but I, I have a specific thing I wanted to say there, which is that 
a lot of the contemporary focus on inequality is asking about various types of persistent inequality. And so intergenerational mobility is one of the conventional ways to think about things. And that is you ask to what extent is an adult's outcomes predictable knowing the socioeconomic status of their parents. And so, you know, obviously more mobile societies are those which get less predictability. Now, I put that on the table because as I see contemporary studies of inequality and particular focuses on black-white inequality, there's two ideas or two phenomena that have to be thought about very hard. The first is the presence of bottlenecks in socioeconomic uh, uh, progress. In other words, that as we think about trajectories of children, adolescents, young adults moving you know, from, uh, from the early family experiences through school, one essential question is to identify these locations in which it's simply hard to take the next step. And so to be blunt, elite universities are one of those examples. In other words, ambition to an elite university offers lots of stuff to the people that get in, but that can be a, that's a bottleneck for people that are not from, from certain families or from certain backgrounds or go to certain schools. And so in thinking about the dynamics of inequality, be it at the national level, the county level, I think focusing on locations in which bottlenecks exist is, is a way of understanding where you get a lot of bang for buck, so to speak. The related idea that I would put there is to think about the importance of, of quantum effects, nonlinear effects. And so what I mean by that is a lot of policy conventionally uh, is thought about, you say, well, if I were to allocate $1,000 to something, you get some effect. I get $2,000, you get twice the effect, $3,000, three times the effect. In fact, I think there's very strong evidence for many phenomena. You get small effects, small effects, small effect. You have to hit a certain threshold to get something that's uh, that's significant. Now, I mentioned, again, it's an abstract principle. The way I said it is it, very intuitive. But that says that maybe in thinking about the allocation of resources, you want to focus them. In other words, you concentrate in a few programs as opposed to spreading them evenly across a lot of admirable programs simply because there are these quantum leaps, as it were, in the efficacy of the programs. The fourth, uh, final thing I would say in thinking kind of, again, very abstractly, is that the determinants of inequality, the determinants of disadvantage and, and affluence are occurring at different scales. What I call the traditional way that, uh, that, that one, uh, a lot of inequality work was thought was to kind of focus on the family in isolation. You want to know something about parental income, something about parental occupation, something about parental education, and ask about how that predicts the uh, issues of uh, offspring. But that's clearly now inadequate. You have to ask different questions. You have to ask questions of the form. What is it we know not just about the family, but about the residential neighborhood? What do we know about the role of schools? What do we know about the, uh, about categories of people, be it defined by gender, defined by ethnicity? So in other words, you have this complex interplay of influences at different scales. And so part of the policy design question has to do with identifying these sensitive points and these interactions where you can get you know, a high rate of return. So I've made these rep, and so I, again, I'm trying to give kind of a kind of a logical template as we have this world which has these threshold effects. Things can, in some cases, be incredibly persistent. In other cases, you have this interplay of social and family factors, and you can get a perfect storm that could lead to persistent disadvantage, or a different type of perfect storm that leads to a persistent advantage. And then the policy question is, how do you identify these these these, these locations where the efficacy is particularly high? And so there, I think I would mention. Uh, you know, some categories of policies where I think that the empirical evidence is, is really very strong. And these will be ones that you know. Um, the first example of is early childhood investment. In other words, uh, you know, work, much of it's spearheaded at the University of Chicago, is I think demonstrated that the returns on intent, uh, high quality early childhood investments, programs in which, you know, three to six year olds are matched with teachers and with their own parents in terms of interactions have very large and persistent consequences. And so there's something, uh, Jim Heckman was a Nobel laureate at Chicago, there has, there's something uh, associated with him called the Heckman curve, which is a claim that the rates of return on these investments are very high for early ages. The, what's going on essentially in this literature is that uh, what's been demonstrated is that uh, these positive, I mean, again, it's high quality early childhood investments have very powerful influences on, uh, on, on, on 
personality and co both cognitive and, and development. In other words, and so you can see the footprints of programs 50 years later. There's data sets where you can actually look at somebody who had a program when they were three years old and see what they're like when they're 53 years old. And without going into all the gory details of how you do the empirical work, the fact is you find demonstrable influences from those types of programs. And so I think the extent to which part of your remit is identifying how to improve educational outcomes for disadvantaged people. Clearly, high quality early childhood investment is one of these places where a what I call the quantum investment has very important consequences. And so I, you know, this is a, uh, you know, it's a literature that really, it's a, again, those of you that are parents could say, we well, of course we knew that these things matter. The magnitudes are what the surprises and the uh, and, and the establishment of the of the of those those numbers I think is a major social science advance that speaks to persistent inequality. The second type of policy that I, I think you know clearly has to be on the table and is fundamental to the sort of work you think of at a county level, let alone at a national level, is is is, is what Mark alluded to, which is the issue of socioeconomic segregation and isolation. In other words, that in, in the United States in 2022, there are you know all these fundamental dimensions along which individuals, communities are isolated from one another and experiencing very different phenomena, which matter or which are determining their kids' future outcomes. So let me just give a few examples of that, uh, very concrete ones. Segregation of the teaching force of the teachers in a school. In other words having all white teachers in a school has deleterious effects on people of color. There's remarkable evidence now that exposure to a single same, same ethnicity teacher has very you know, demonstrable persistent effects in terms of future academic performance. Now, understanding the reasons for that's hard. Is it a matter that this is the first teacher that doesn't uh, stereotype the student? Or is it a matter that uh, there's a, uh, a role model effect? These are not known, but the, the bottom line is that's in the data. And I think that those studies say something very important, which is that in thinking about the composition of, of instructors, this is a very small example of segregation that matters. A second example is that there's very strong evidence that simply that the economic segregation these to persistent outcomes. And so the government, the federal government ran a number of programs to actually test this, essentially gave school vouchers, I'm sorry, uh, housing vouchers to, to disadvantaged families, some of which could move anywhere, other which ones were required to move to low, low poverty neighborhoods defined uh, in a certain way. You then trace out the effects on the families and you trace out the effects on the kids. As you know, there's now enough years you can see these things. And these vouchers are associated with substantial improvements in socioeconomic outcomes of children. So, you know, in understanding the nature of these programs, it's not a matter that people were moving from you know, the poorest neighborhoods in Southern California to Beverly Hills. They were moving to, to simply less disadvantaged neighborhoods, uh, to, you know, to, 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 to say it boldly. But again, you find these very powerful influences. Now that strikes me as an example where you have many actionable policies. Again, I'm you know I'm speaking in a, in a, as somebody who's sitting in a classroom and not in an office, not you know on the front lines the way you are. This is you know these are the justifications, for example, for uh, for mixed income housing requirements. In other words, explicit efforts that say that the development of uh, of, of of new groups of homes have to uh, have to facilitate the people mixing from different income backgrounds. A second example, and you know, this is a, a standard one. Is the this is the the problem with many of the zoning restrictions in the United States? Where, you know, the most common one, of course, being that uh, certain neighborhoods cannot have multifamily dwellings, uh, which is a fancy way of saying no apartments. Can, you know, keep up housing prices and the like. Uh, but you can go through an entire litany of the ways in which uh, you know local local regulations facilitate economic segregation. Of course, those interact with racial segregation and, and are produce, you know, which is a, a phenomena that's distinct in an order of magnitude greater than economic segregation. But all of that is something that you can, that is, that you can think about in terms of actionable policies. And so I would certainly put all of those on the table. Uh, the third set of factors that I think have become increasingly clear as determinants of inequality, again, will not shock you. And what maybe is the shock is the magnitudes of the influences uh, has to do with with social with you know 
problems in neighborhoods. Most obviously, you know, one example is simply the heterogeneity and lead exposure between neighborhoods that are rich and poor. And in the city of Chicago, you know, again, you know, if you're looking, you know, sort of neighborhood by neighborhood between black people, blacks and whites. In other words, there's really shocking degrees of, of, of segregation with respect to environmental hazards. And so that clearly, you know, that one, in some sense, you see what the action item is. You have to <laughs> implement policies that do everything possible to clean out lead. And there's, of course, lots of evidence that, you know, the efforts to do that have, have had, you know, there's been racial disparities in the uh, in the intensity, but that becomes a clear policy. A second example of what I'm saying are kind of, you know, ills of neighborhoods which are damaging to children is, again, there's, again, there's very powerful evidence that exposure to violence has you know, catastrophic effects on education. And so one would put that on the table is something that, you know, because there's a direct statement about how do you allocate resources to, uh, to, to reduce exposure to violence in certain neighborhoods. Now, that, of course, leads to the flip side of this. The other disaster in many neighborhoods is the red levels of incarceration of people. And so the thing I don't think that criminologists have a, you know, a clear policy about is how do you simultaneously promote diminution of exposure to violence and address it in ways that also respect the carceral state as causing its own forms of segregation in the sense that people uh, it, that families in which you have you know many fa family members that are that are incarcerated or isolated and and from others and so those all strike me as kind of the, the sorts of actionable items that i would think that uh the bum wants to think about now going back to what i called the kind of the the, the conceptual template it, I think, in, you know, and again, in, in, in thinking about, you know, black, white inequality, to be very concrete about this, um, the fundamental issues there are kind of, uh, you, know, you know, are at different levels. One's simply moral, and other monstrous things happen, and the footprints, the consequences of that are, are living with us. The second is a contemporary stuff that's wrong, but I'm just saying the, you know, what, what's increasingly clear is that that, that that American society does not have self-correction mechanisms built into it. In other words, that there's not that the historical injustices we observe, the rates at which their consequences decay are so slow that we're, they're sitting around today uh, in in ways that are really really mystifying. Not, not mystifying, but you know, morally, you know, profoundly troubling. And so I put all of that on the table as, as, as I said, as a set of, I'll say more, not just metaphors, but heuristics. And that is to think about, you know, the process of, of socioeconomic evolution across families between parents, children, grandchildren, uh, is one that's replete with, with, with traps. And so what I mean by a trap is that certain configurations of you know of disadvantage make it really hard for the make the probability the children will be qualitatively better off very low and as i emphasize there's another set of traps you have to think about which is affluence traps and that is that some families can lock themselves in in such ways that uh, regardless of uh, the merits of, or the uh, uh, of their kids they uh, they end up with uh, you know with, with high levels of success and so for that reason, what I, again, I would just say, I think as a heuristic is to ask how do you can concentrate resources in particular pressure points in this evolving socioeconomic system where you have the highest probability of breaking the persistence. And so for me, that's why I emphasize this idea of bottlenecks. In other words, that there's, and this is where, you know, I would urge, I would hope that the existing social science can be drawn upon is as possible to think through these and I help identify these particular locations where where the where interventions actions to try to promote equality will have particularly persistent effects so that that's pretty much what i wanted to cover i hope it wasn't too i, I know i talked too fast uh, i i've have 35 years of students that have assured me of that and i apologize uh but i th th those were really the ideas i wanted to put on the table and that was that i think that in contemporary thinking about inequality uh, you know, there are these issues of bottlenecks and what I call threshold effects. In other words, there's a need, you know, marginal policies are going to have qualitatively weaker effects than non-marginal policies. And that leads to hard choices as to where to concentrate resources. The second thing to say is I think that the, inter, you know, the, the increasing recognition of the social determinants of inequality requires policies that directly address that and be it uh, 
identifying locations where where intense investments can respond to the dis, the disadvantages that certain communities have experienced and that's that clearly isn't there's a, a prior there, there's a clear uh clear um you know argument in that favor and similarly i think that just thinking very broadly about the issues of segregation and how racial and economic segregation by implication are inducing segregation with respect to uh, health health hazards with respect you know the, you have you have the usual ones school quality uh, and the like but we also have health hazards we have differential exposures to violence and differential damages to communities because of uh of, of the nature of the current criminal justice system and so by focusing on how to break those segregation patterns i think one has Roots to uh, to facilitate uh, reductions of, of of the the unjust inequalities that I started my my conversation with. So let me uh, is that is it okay? might we stop here and take questions or talk? Very much appreciated, Stephen. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, uh, any of the commissioners have questions or comments, please. Uh, Wendy Raymer. Yes, hi, and I apologize. My camera is not working today, so otherwise I would have been on here um, with my attention fully on <laughs> the discussion at hand. Thank you so much for your presentation. You know, um, as I was listening to you, know, list, you know, uh, these, you know, particular issue areas and where to concentrate and, and it really does cover most of, you know, the social issues of our time. I'm curious, I want to flip it. So have you identified or experienced any policies that um, just are useless? <laughs> you know, I mean, your advice is where we should double down, where we should, you know, identify these bottlenecks. What are you seeing as far as policies in general that really just the the shouldn't be there, or we should clear that those out so that we do have the resources and attention span to focus on these you know most impactful um, threshold type solutions? So I'm not sure I have a good list that that I could I would identify. I think there's certain policies that I, I'm quite comfortable saying have been profoundly counterproductive. And I mentioned one of them which is, the, is the harshness of criminal penalties. In other words, the level of resources that's involved in incarcerating people and the way that the criminal justice system is, is, is addressing uh, these types of issues is anybody wants to argue that that this is that again i'm not i'm going beyond ethics now. i'm like efficiency it's just a great catastrophic waste of resources uh are going on there so that's certainly a place where mm -hmm. i think uh, I, I i would identify that if you kind of had you know a, a coterie of economists come in and ask what aspects of uh of various anti-poverty policies do we think are badly designed there would be a set of, of suspects there and in essence, what they would say is that some some of the programs, such as Medicaid, have have discontinuities in um, uh, you know kind of the benefits to people that can create disincentives, and mm -hmm. uh, and there's some evidence those disincentives matter. The answer, by the way, is not to cut the benefits. The answer is to change the uh, the notches in the program in such a way that there's a smooth uh, change in the benefits as people uh, have higher uh, you know income from labor markets. So those would be kind of two easy ones that come to it uh, mm -hmm. come into play um but i think that um you know where what i was trying to emphasize with obviously were the cases where i think that there's evidence of the of policies having having a substantial effect mm -hmm. um, you mentioned uh, the zoning um yeah. one a little bit right about like how certain neighborhoods or certain zoning policies really are just meant to keep certain people in and certain people out um that was you know an interesting one to me well the, yeah so, so that one i was <laughs> the policy was efficacious <laughs> they're efficacious they work but they were leading to you know unjust outcomes so in that sense mm -hmm. uh you know I, i'll call that a policy that had a the intent was not good uh even so but it, it worked but it was not a desirable one yeah Thank other you. Qu other questions or oh uh commissioner of uh, who who am i seeing ah okay our other wendy we got all our wendy questions coming please 
<laughs> You're being barraged. <laughs> um, thank you for laying that out. Uh, very comprehensive. I think it's always the combination of you know, income education, health, safety, structural racism. You know, we see variations on those themes. So I just, I wondered, you know, in your research or, you know, what you're coming across, are you seeing um, really striking two generation policies that offer a lot of promise, right? So folks that become more financially stable, allow their kids to become more financially stable, the kids get better education and wealth grows. And so, you know, I, I wondered, so like, two generation, and then it sort of leads me to say, you know, like are the things that you think actually work really well in pairing together, you get a lot more out of different interventions and programs if they're paired together. And then I would just sort of ask, what surprised you recently and what you've seen that's been extremely effective that you might not have, you know, thought about or we're not thinking about, you know, from this whole buffet of stuff we need to do. Well, I, I think the two that come to mind is I I was surprised at the magnitude of the effects of uh, of lead and by implication on lead abatement for educational outcomes. In other words, it was one thing to know there's an effect, but the the effects were far stronger than I thought. A second example is I uh, would be the uh, I'll, I'll give two two related examples. Uh, one of them is the effects of uh, of the of the initial exposure to a same uh, ethnicity uh, teacher. In other words, the idea that that would have an effect is obviously like, there's clear reasons why you would expect that. The magnitudes were again were surprising to me. Here's an example of a program where I was surprised there was an effect in, at all. Uh, and there's been a set of interventions at colleges, and what they do in freshman orientation week is they they identify. Uh, students of color, students from maybe first gen, and you have what are called modest interventions, which are some programs where they talk to upperclassmen about the college experience. And uh, and the explicit purpose of this is to tell pe tell freshmen who have come in, you belong here. So in other words, you may be at a, you know, you come into an environment, suddenly almost, you know, <laughs> there are very few people of color here. And you may go into a class and your first grades were not going to be very strong. So the question is, how do you process that? And so here, the serious point is the following, and that is people come from very disparate high schools. And so it's not a shock that if you take certain classes, <laughs> it's predictive how people do based on who their high school, uh, what, where they went. And so what I'm saying is what, what appeared to be modest interventions in terms of having upperclassmen communicate, you belong here, you're gonna succeed. It may be, it's gonna be, it could be rougher for you. It could be a more difficult transition than from people from other backgrounds. Again, those programs have shown. This is the part I was surprised by. It was what you know, like you know, it's a couple of hours in the fresh before freshman year. There was demonstrable evidence that it mattered four to six years later. So the two, you know, how do you measure these things? You sort of ask, what's the probability of graduating six years? What's the probability you, you end up in certain taking certain courses? And what does the grades look like? And so, I guess what I'm trying to say is this is an, another example. The, the reason this struck me was it's again, I, what did I have in my head? All these things happen your freshman year. Why would one thing kind of have a have a persistent effect when there's a million other things that 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 come? Is I was not thinking clearly, and that is that when you have this event, this intervention, it entails all of these things dynamically. So the first time a class doesn't go well, you don't say it's me. You say it's hard. So. There's a dependence in the choices that adolescents make that this these interventions revealed again. I, 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 I made that reason you should I put a different mathematical model in my head of all these processes and made me think that you have this kind of the, this issue of self reinforcement. And so you have these locations in development. It can be for adolescents or it could be for uh, college students where you have to make sure that you're getting these positive events happening there because those are the things that get reinforced. To give a completely different example of an, a, a program which, um, um, which I heard a lecture on and, uh, by a psychologist at Michigan, where she talked about a program that in essence took a, a K through eight school and took students that were four years behind, um, these are, you know, qualitatively, four years behind on reading and assigned them to be tutors to kindergartners in reading. And the scores of the tutors went up. Now, there was nothing for them to learn. So even if they were 13 at their nine-year-old level, tutoring a five-year-old doesn't help in terms of the material 
So why would the why would the why did the uh, scores go up for the people that were behind? It was the first time anybody said you're a good reader. You have something to offer other people. And so again, the reason I'm kind of going off on this route is I think one of the key things in thinking about these these dynamical processes is that as we're thinking about children and adolescents, this these positive and negative reinforcements are extremely powerful. And so interventions that add these positive uh, these positive events create the virtuous circle and have these long run consequences. So I would definitely put that on the table. Thank you, Commissioner Alston. Yes, I was just going back to your opening comments, Dr. Durloff, and you talked about uh, some of the learnings and readings you all had around reparations. I was curious to know what some of those uh, learnings were and what you might have to offer. I'm thinking more specifically, for example, the uh, program implemented in Evanston has come under quite a bit of controversy about, first of all, whether it is or isn't accurate in terms of uh, reparations as, as defined by many addressing the issues of those directly descended of, of, of slavery versus whether it's just a number of different social interventions that are more contemporary in, in their impacts, but actually have nothing to do with the longer term arc of uh, social inequality. So just interested in some of your yeah. and comments on, on that. So so I guess I would step, uh, I, I think you actually hit what is a fundamental issue and it was a little bit of what, even though I didn't, wasn't explicit about it is in thinking about reparations, there's, you know, there's two normative, arguments, two dimensions, there's many more ethical dimensions, but two different <clears throat> people is the direct re, is redress of wrongs. In other, and so, um, you know, that you identify a community, a group of people that have been wronged, and you ask, how do you, how do you respond to that? A second is to say, there's a community that was grievously wronged, and as a result of the structures in society, the, the consequences of the wrongs are still here. And that's more the idea of, of structural discrimination, structural racism. Mm -hmm. And my focus has been thinking about reparations as ways to address the systemic problem as, uh, of that, that these wrongs, didn't, they live forever. And so what do I mean by that? You know, part of the background, obviously, to reparations is the fact that the black-white wealth disparities are orders of it's an order of magnitude bigger than black-white income inequality. And so, and understand those mechanisms. That's where the you have these the, the, this this deep path dependence. And so, an easy example is is land ownership. I mean, it wasn't just the fact that there was no land redistribution in 1865 and Reconstruction. It was a set of discriminatory acts that um, that, that denied African Americans opportunities to own land. And so. If one, if on that focus, that kind of becomes direct. You would set up policies that are directly going to promote a reequalization there. In other cases, I think that uh, you know, and, and I'm, I'm sorry if I'm rambling. I'm saying th those are ones where you could sort of say, here's the direct set of policies, here's the direct consequence, here's the direct thing to reverse. A different thing to say is that in in a society, there are all these acts of discrimination that don't go rectified, and all of these and acts of discrimination have these complicated rippling consequences throughout communities. And so an easy example of that is every time an African-American employee is denied a job or potential employee doesn't get a job because they're discriminated against, they're harmed, but so is their family and so is everybody they know, because that's how information about labor market opportunities diffuse. And so what David McMillan and I have been trying to push is this idea that the, a way to, again, I want to be clear, it's, you know, he gets more credit than I do on most of this. And he's also working with Sandy Darity on other dimensions of this. And so I want you know, either the, the attributions to be appropriate. A key factor in thinking about this is the extent to which we think of reparations as a response to the fact our society didn't have it in it to correct all these wrongs for the last 150, 60 years. And that's different than saying that you identify the individual persons from this event were harmed. So, again, I, when I say you have the, quite one of the questions in Evanston is that somebody have an ancestor that was specifically discriminated against in Evanston, uh, and th and that has to do with what I call the direct compensatory issue. 
the second issue type of ethics on discrimination is uh, it has to do with the, the, the system is the product of, of accumulation of wrongs and didn't address them. And if you'll forgive me giving some po a political overtone to this, one type has to do with guilt and the other has to do with shame. In other words, it's one thing to identify matching victim, you know, wrongdoers and victims. That's the guilt side. The shame side is the society didn't, regardless of doing the matching, didn't address the wrongs. And and you know, as you and in trying to build political consensus, I think it's useful to distinguish those in the way that one argues for the policies. So I hope that was somewhat responsive to what you're asking. Yes, I, I think some of this, particularly looking at those two uh, particular dimensions and then raising the question, let's say, for example, from the standpoint of, uh, of this commission, what then might we have or, or consider at our disposal in, in terms of, uh, I don't want to just say mitigating, but, you know, trying to dismantle uh, those type of in, in, inequities once identified. Yeah, or all of those different uh, socioeconomic determinant bottlenecks that you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so that's why I wanted to say that to, at least my my attempt to formulate the arguments on reparations is that these bottlenecks, these traps are there, and society has an absolute obligation to break them. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Mails. Thank you, uh, uh, Mark, very much. Uh, professor, this is uh, touching on so much of my current work, and I do not mean this as a commercial, but I did get my doctorate at the University of Chicago I think <clears throat> before you got yours, I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, none of my work today is for the University of Chicago, but rather for an organization called the Discovery Partners Institute, which is part of the U of I system. Uh, in that, lies much of what you talked about in our work, teach the student, teach the teacher. And we're talking about four, grades four through 14 probably. And it is also in terms of teaching the teacher, we're uh, getting teachers certified in data and computer sciences in the public schools who look like the kids that they teach. Because if we're going to grab what the future of uh, many work uh, enterprises will be, it will be technical. It'll be uh, somewhat uh, based in coding, computer science. These are not jobs, these are careers. And in order to do that, the recruitment of teachers requires that those teachers take time from their teaching daily responsibilities. And these are going to be funded for them, almost all, so that they can do the 15 month asynchronous learning and become certified in the state of Illinois. That means they're teaching one teacher who gets certified is probably touching, uh, you know, 60 lives uh, when they go back in the classroom. And yeah, this fantastic. you multiply that times the hundreds of people that they'll touch when once we get 20 and 50 teachers certified. So they are teaching fourth graders. And that's the second point you made to give people role models, examples, maybe not mentors, but you never know what can come out of a relationship. The extraordinary work of the DPI is, I guess, unique in that it, it stretches statewide. It doesn't uh, limit itself to the south side of Chicago, but includes that. And I do want to put a plug in for um, our member commissioner, Soshi Flores, the incredible commitment of the Office of the President and the Bureau of Economic Development to help us connect with, I think, what is the most uniquely qualified person in the county, the president, who a school, former school teacher, who can help us all touch the lives of teachers because she was one. And uh, so she, thank you for all the connections you made for the DPI. And thank you for this commercial. <laughs> it's like, it, it's an amazing thing that you're doing and you're talking about and we're living it. Uh, it's happening right now and I'm happy to send you a link and introduce- I, 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 would, I would very much like to see that. I mean, it's, um, it, it's moving to know that you're about this program. Thank you. Thanks to both of you. Commissioner De Laurentiis. You're on mute. Hi, thank you. 
Apologize for that. Uh, I am Christy De Laurentiis. I represent the South Suburban Mayors and Managers Association, which is 45 member municipalities in the South Suburbs. Many of them are the most resource strapped communities in the state of Illinois, and many of them are, are uh, recognized as some of the most challenging in the entire country. So I'm really interested in this topic. And one of the things that I wanted to mention to you and to this body is that we, we as an organization have sort of um, tried to develop in advance some policies related to uh, really the socioeconomic isolation, the segregation that you identified. And what we've started to say is that in addition to this um, recognized, you know, your future shouldn't be determined uh, upon you know, the place of your birth or your current zip code. But really also we're expanding that to also say your, your, your effective tax rate. Because what we see is in areas that have high tax rates, it's because there's been systemic you know, structural racism, commercial redlining, loss of uh, uh, school funding, all of these kind of cyclical events that are creating uh, uh, areas of isolation and um, and uh, challenge. So we're really focused on that and trying to advance strategies that address that. The tax rates we're working on a lot on tax policy, and um, I see there is an opportunity, particularly coming out of post you know pandemic or the pandemic, with this notion of build back better. It's really trying to put the resources where they're most needed. And I know the county has been very committed to that, a huge partner of ours, uh, really through the leadership of President Preckwinkle. But what I would say, it's, um, you know, small wins that we're hoping, you know, create some momentum. And I just uh, welcome the comments that you have about that. Well, I don't think I have much more to say than that's was wonderful to hear. I mean, to be honest, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very moved by what the programs that you guys have been des describing. You know, it's easy for me to I have some you know theory in my head, but you're you're on the front lines. You're actually addressing these things, so it's it's fantastic. And the um, the issue of the taxes, I guess my colleague Chris Berry has worked on a related issue, which is injustices in the assessment rates uh, across across neighborhoods where. Um, uh, <laughs> The more affluent we're benefiting from uh, from the, the the way the valuations are were done, but I think that that's it, what you brought up is extremely important. The only thing I would add to it is it also indicates why some of the measures that are used for um, talking about inequality are, are are inadequate. So, what I mean by that is, if you just look at kind of per pupil expenditure as the metric for inequality. There's very large disparities. They're state specific. So Texas is much higher, for example, in other states because there's little there isn't redistribution or state level programs augmenting it. What I'm trying to say is that we have to not just look at the amount of money. We have to look at what's being spent on. And so if schools have to expend a lot of their resources on, I'll say protection because of uh, you know of, of, of crime and things, that doesn't go to books. And so part of what I heard from you was that you have to, we have to think more comprehensively about school resources at two levels. One of them is kind of the disparities in who's generating them and how hard it is. And the second, what I'm throwing in as the addendum to that is, is what the allocations are. And so what I would call these, these inequalities in neighborhoods, they also distort the, uh, you know, the capacity to convert the resources of the schools into, into, into certain things. I'll just add to that because I'm sitting uh, with uh, Commissioner Killen here on the same call, but a lot of the challenge too is that if there's lack of resources going in, there's uh, not the infrastructure and trans you know there's uh, transportation deserts and all of that. So yeah, it's very cyclical and it means that there's less jobs and less you know employment at the neighborhood level. So certainly something that we're challenged by and I'm always uh, appreciative of all the thoughtful gleanings and uh, lessons learned from colleagues here. So thank you for your comments today. Oh, thank you, of course. Thanks to both of you. Any other comments or questions from the commission? Well, I, I have a few, um, Vice Chairman, just before you go, you always have uh, such in-depth questions, but I just want to make a really quick observation. Um, I think one of uh, a great takeaway today, especially, especially when we're talking about the socioeconomic segregation, 
um, is we have the Cook County Land Bank. And I think that I, we, we've tried, um, you know, to figure out how we uh, fit as a commission. And I um, was made aware that on Tuesday, there, there seems to have been a new selection for a new executive director of the land bank. And I'm hoping that at some opportunity, you know, we'll have opportunities in the future to be able to invite uh, Jessica Caffrey, um, who has been with the uh, in, in real estate in the county um, and, and now potentially going to be handling as an executive director to the land bank to really address this because as we see that the land bank is a great asset to be able to get properties back in the tax row, I also think it's a great opportunity to make sure that, you know, there is that exposure and um, and we work towards that accessibility um, for individuals to create more equity. Um, and I think just some of the things that were highlighted in regards to uh, the results and the impact that it could cause in the long term, not only obviously in, in, in the classroom, but, you know, based on what Christy was saying about, you know, where, where you grow up, where, where your zip code is and and just like the the impact of what that um, can be, I think that it's extremely important for us to look for these opportunities. And I, I look forward to uh, continuing this conversation because I think that there is a lot to unpack and there's a lot of initiatives that we can definitely play a very important role in. So I just wanted to make that observation. Thank you, Vice Chair. I, I do see Superintendent Killen. Um, has yes, her. please, Commissioner Killen, if you'd be so kind. Yes, thank you. Wonderful presentation. And as we're, you know, just thinking about the different ways here in county government. So I run Cook County's transportation group, how we can help address inequities where you might think transportation's off to the side. Um, conversations that actually started here, um, you know, Commission of Social Innovation, in conjunction with some of our mobility work that we were doing in the Southland, we created the, the fair transit pilot. So this is where we talk about, you know, zip codes, where you're born, you know, how should that how should that dictate your future? But more importantly, how do we create access to opportunity? And Christy, thank you for kind of queuing me up a little bit on this one. But that's where I say we're looking at how uh, transit fair policy can have impacts on jobs that one can attain. And it also comes back to not just how we work with transit service providers to provide that reduced fare where Cook County is providing the offset to that fare so you can have a more convenient, more accessible transit route to your job, but how we can also bring that infrastructure investment back into communities. It's not just giving access and reduce fare to let you board or maybe take a metro train instead of taking a pace to CTA train to CTA bus to get you there more efficiently and put those jobs within reach, but how we also need to look at the flip side of that and make investments in communities, as Christy was saying, making sure we're addressing the tax implications, but bringing those jobs closer to home to help to help um, eradicate some of those inequities that occur today to have a four hour back and forth commute just to have a good paying job. Any uh, any reaction to that, Stephen? Well, I'm, I'm, it was more, I just was reflecting on it. There was an old idea, an older idea in the inequality literature, something called spatial mismatch. And that is that, uh, the relationship where we people live and where their jobs are could create a lot of inequities because of transportation costs. And so um, you're you're addressing that, but you brought it's I'd say you're directly addressing that because you're asking the question of how do you facilitate the capacity of uh, of people to actually I'll say integrate themselves in in beyond the the, the where you live. And so what I mean by that is one question is kind of where you know segregation at the level of residence, and another is, is segregation with respect to workplace. And so part of what you're addressing is your, the possibility of, of the one doesn't entail the other. But the other thing you brought up that I was, I was you know, again, was, just pro, was thinking about was the issue of what people bring back. In other words, it's not just a matter that you go off to the job, you come back and, and nothing matters. The point is that's bringing things to the community. And that's a little bit what I was referring to when I said that, uh, yeah, in thinking about the process of, of, of labor market success, it's very driven by social networks, opportunities for jobs, people communicate them to the people they know. And so that's another example where if you if you integrate, that you break the, the, the labor, the segregation in terms of where people work, by implication that goes back to the community and breaks segregation in the uh, in the information flows. And so that, that, that was the thing that I was just, just kind of processing as you were talking, so it's very interesting. Well, thank you. Um... Yes, I, um, I I just have um, not so much a question, although I'll end with a question. 
uh, but an observation, and that is, uh, Stephen, as you and I were speaking, speaking before the, this meeting, and we've talked over the last few weeks, um, you know, it occurred to me how your work would intersect with the um, social policy recommendations that are being incubated in various of our working groups. And uh, so as I hear you today and I hear a number of the commissioners speak, I see um, through lines and cross currents that go essentially through many or most of our working groups. Uh, and I'll just check them off to give you how I'm thinking about this. So we have a, a working group on community investment vehicles. And obviously you're talking about investment and disinvestment. Uh, we have a working group on diverse talent pipelines. We're talking about diversity and inclusion, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a working group on reparations, which uh, Commissioner Austin mentioned and you mentioned. Uh, we have a working group on crime and criminal justice, uh, which uh, is chaired by Commissioner Austin. Um, and um, it, it, it seems to me that um, as we kind of wind down for the year and look forward to the new year, where hopefully some of the work we've in, invested in over this year will manifest itself in policies that actually are brought to the county board and where they support those policies. Um, you would be a wonderful resource for us. I know you sell yourself short. You're enormously humble and enormously gifted. And um, it, it is kind of a, a, an academic or a theoretical guy, but in reality, you have such extraordinary practical knowledge that could help inform our work in a, in a way that is um, different from, and in some ways um, essential from a more holistic point of view, as we look at our various working groups and how how they um, how they reveal their work product. So the question is this: Would would you be willing to serve uh, just kind of ad hoc uh, as working groups uh, may wish to tap into your expertise and your your knowledge, because it seems to me when we talk about a commission on social innovation, uh, we might very well have labeled it in a way more compatible with your field of fields of study. And uh, so I think there is great uh, compatibility between your research, your writings, your teaching, your 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 um, thought leadership as a public intellectual and the work that we're seeking to accomplish here. So I, I, I would ask if you might be willing to be imposed upon uh, from time to time as the working groups undertake their their jobs as commissioners. Is, is that something you might entertain? Well, it's not an imposition. I'd love to do it. Okay. Uh, I, I I learned things from this conversation today. I mean, you may have seen I was taking notes. It wasn't, uh, there was a reason for it. You were describing policies, some of them I didn't know about, and other ones that made me think different. Just, you know, just to get that one example, the, the issue about the spatial mismatch, just <laughs> when you were describing it, it made me think about a different question. So this is not a matter of, it, I get it, I would benefit from it. So, you know, at the personal level, but more importantly, you're, you're doing so important. If I could do any marginal benefit to that, obviously I want to do that. Well, it, it's very kind of you, and again, uh, further evidence of your humility and, uh, and 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 testament to your extraordinary leadership. So, uh, thank you for that, and um, you know, I think we've all benefited enormously from your contribution today, and look forward to collaborating with you going forward as our work continues to unfold. And you know, as you see, this is an all hands on deck effort. Uh, each of us has a specific area of expertise or interest, but all of us are broadly interested in driving social change. And uh, together, collectively, uh, we're able to deliver more than any one of us individually might. So uh, your your contributions here are, are very welcome, and uh, we're very grateful for what you've uh, what you've offered. It's, 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 it's very flattering and kind. Thank you. Well, very kind of you. So um, and and. Um, Stephen, as we now kind of move forward with the balance of the meeting, uh, again, thank you so much for what you've already contributed. 
you're more than welcome to stick around to hear the balance of this. If you want to take off and do other things, we would fully uh, understand that. I, as I well. unfortunately have family obligations, but uh, I would love to have the opportunity to interact again. And, and I'm grateful that I had a chance to meet you and do well, you, 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 you undoubtedly will have that opportunity and we will have that privilege. So thanks again and uh, appreciate your being with us. All and right. thanks for all your good work. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care, everybody. Okay. Thank Bye -bye. you. So, uh, Commissioner and I, unless you have a different preference, I, I think what I would suggest at this point is we uh, go through the working groups to see if there are reports available today. Again, recognizing that we're going to be looking for much more uh, substantive contributions at the December meeting. Is, is that okay with you that we move in that direction? Yes, absolutely. We, I think that's the next item on the agenda. So. Very much appreciate that. So, uh, as we as we move forward, uh, the Community Investment uh, Vehicle Group. And uh, Commissioner Raymer, if you have something to offer in that department, we'd love to hear from you. If you're if you're still around, I think you may have departed. Uh, and I know- I she signed out that she was gone. Yeah, Commissioner Freeman was unable to attend today. Uh, and Diverse Talent Pipelines, uh, Commissioner Aglope, I don't think is here. Is there someone speaking for that working group? Not hearing anyone. Uh, the uh, unutilized church property, uh, com former Commissioner Yonan had shared that group, and uh, I don't know that we've named someone to succeed him, and I don't know if there's anyone specifically working on that effort, but if there is, we'd love to hear from such person. Uh, 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 actually, uh, SSMMA was involved in that committee, and I have uh, had some preliminary meetings with uh, municipal representatives, so trying to ascertain whether or not this is an issue that's kind of bubbling up within various communities as not-for-profits, uh, you know, are challenged with, with their properties or uh, whether or not the, the uh, Catholic churches have, you know, identified any surplus parcels. So we've gotten some preliminary information. It's not pervasive, but we are trying to ascertain what uh, kind of challenge this presents going forward. So continue to have some discussion about that Thank in the new year, I think. Rentus, and if I can be of any help to you, especially between now and December, to flesh any of that out so we have something to uh, work with as we wind down the year, I'd be happy to help in any way I can. I appreciate your effort. Appreciate your stepping up. Um, and the um, working group on reparations, which is chaired by Commissioner Anderson, I don't believe he is here this evening. Is there someone working on that uh, effort? If not, we'll we'll pass over that. Uh, Commissioner Killen, electric vehicles. Yeah, so I think I'm actually a one woman band on, on this work group. So we're actually looking at just in our own work here, county transportation, the work that the state is doing, what uh, CMAP is doing, but really trying to look at that relationship between opportunity and land use and looking at areas of high concentration of freight activity and where we see um, pop, um, EJ populations looking at Justice 40 initiative where there might be certain parcels open for development that we may want to work with communities on um, electric fleet opportunities. So that is, we're actually undertaking some work internal to the department on this right now. So it's trying to bring together the work of all the collective groups on the topic, but it's still very early. Very much appreciate that. And I appreciate your carrying this solo for the moment. Again, same offer applies to you if I can be of any help and moving this along, please feel free to call on me and I'll be happy to do whatever I can. And thanks thanks for your, your contribution. And Commissioner Alston, the Crime and Criminal Justice uh, Working Group, if you have something to tell us, we'd appreciate it. Well, I don't have anything new other than my ongoing appeal for folks to put their, their hands up. I, I know Wendy graciously reached out and we talked about some ideas. I have been collecting some literature that I'm going to try to work to summarize and, and make available as some starting points in terms of conversation and, and ideas. But given your uh, thrust for the December meeting, I guess I better turn up the heat on. Well, that, that was that, that was what I was hoping <laughs> might be the reaction. And I appreciate that. And again, if I could be helpful to you in moving this along, please let me know. And I'd be delighted to do that. Obviously, it's an extremely important uh, subject matter for the commission. Um, and thank you for your effort. And uh, finally, the Industrial Policy Working Group, Commissioner Thomas, if you have something to report, we'd love to hear about it. 
Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, we had our first meeting. Um, the work group is so far made up of um, Commissioner Cooley and myself. Commissioner Malone hopefully will join us. And of course, Commissioner Lane, you will. Vice Chair Lane, you um, are interested in staying connected. So we had our first meeting. Our second meeting will be November 18th probably 2 p.m. If anybody is interested, please reach out to me. There's a couple of you that I see on the screen that I'm gonna reach out to with some specific questions. Um, we just started with some brainstorming about uh, what could a possible sort of policy uh, structure look like that would make sense coming out of the work group and then would come to the commission. So very early, we're gonna have our second meeting we will have something substantive for the December meeting. It might not be as substantive as you imagine after a couple of meetings, but we will have something substantive. I'm looking forward to talking more well, we, about we that. Would, we would welcome the end, Commissioner Thomas. Thank you. And I would also like to uh, uh, take a cue from what you said beyond that, but more procedurally. And that is, as you look at folks on the screen, uh, chairs of the working other working groups, uh, nothing prevents you from tapping the shoulders of anybody you see or anyone else who's on the commission that isn't here right now if you think they might add value to your yes. work. Yes. Because uh, again, this is all hands on deck and uh, all of us together are smarter than any one, two, three, four, or five of us. So uh, please uh, feel uh, uh, unconstrained in reaching out to others who may yeah. uh, contribute to, to your work. So thank you for thank that. You. Mm -hmm. And uh, Madam Chair, I uh, think that is the conclusion of the working group reports. Thank you, Vice Chair Lane. Um, so I, I know that we, um, uh, we're gonna be discussing if there's um, any announcements. I, I, I don't think necessarily we have all of the details for um, the December, but we'll make sure to keep you all updated. We're hoping to do it in person. Um, we are confirming the 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 office. Um, I'm sorry, the the boardroom, so that everybody is able <coughs> to go there. So we will be in close communication with you all, um, so that we can move forward um, in accordance to OMA. Um, and we will make sure that you know if if, if anybody has any specific um, um issues getting there that we'll 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 maybe you know square that away early on um so i don't know I, i'll open it up for any additional um comments or any additional announcements um you know i'm i'm really excited that we are coming to to a close in the first year um of of being of of going back to the the regular um you know monthly uh, meetings and having so many great presentations and so many discussions that are um happening so i think uh, I'm excited for um, you know what's next for the commission. Um, so I'll, I guess I'll open it up again for any final comments or any announcements from any of the members. I actually had something that occurred to me. Um, I just wanted to make sure the word was getting out um, that the Illinois Department of Human Services just announced um, capital assistance. Um, program for nonprofits that are providing a range of human services. So for their maybe capital assistance needs. So I'll forward that on in case people haven't seen that. I just want to make sure the word gets out because there are so many organizations that own their buildings or building out and just may not be in that network to hear about it. So I'll forward that. Thank you, Carrie. Much appreciated. Thank you. Any other announcements? Okay, so I will then entertain a motion to adjourn. Can I have a, a, a mover and a seconder, please? So I'll second. second. I second. Okay, I didn't catch the seconder. Was it? It might have been Wendy. I think you had a few. But... <laughs> Take your pick. Okay. All right. Um, so I. I didn't hear who. Um, anybody want to just quickly raise? I'll second. Hand? Okay, thank you. So get in, Harry Alston. Okay. Um, all those in favor of a German, say aye. 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 Those the eyes have it. We're adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, I'm everybody. Stay safe. Be well. Super good program thank today. You. Thanks. 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 Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye.